Hey, welcome back to another Eye Care for Your Brain with board certified neuropsychologist, Dr. Karen Sullivan. Today's topic is the new Alzheimer's drug, Lakembi. We are very excited about this class of drugs because they are the very first disease modifying drugs that we have for Alzheimer's disease. The importance of this invention, this creation, uh, cannot be overstated. These are game changers, but it's very important that as they stand now, you understand that they're not miracle drugs, they're not cures, they don't reverse any of the symptoms, and they don't stop the disease. In fact, there's a number of things that you really need to know about these compounds, including their risks, the small group of people who are are actually eligible. We have a whole lot of promise for the potential of these drugs in the future to help the next generation, but of course they are on the market now. So I want you to understand tonight the risks and the benefits, and maybe most important is access and how to have realistic, appropriate expectations of the outcome for you or a loved one. So Lakembi is the brand name for the compound called Lacanamab, and this is the second of two FDA drugs in this class that have been approved for mild Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease. These are the first Alzheimer's drugs that have been approved by the FDA in 20 years. There was limited approval in January 2023 under the Accelerated Approval Program for the FDA. And after that, they submitted some more data. And this summer, we actually had full approval for the drug. We have five other FDA medications that modestly reduce symptoms of Alzheimer's disease by changing the amount of two neurotransmitters in the brain, glutamate and cold. We have cholinesterase inhibitors. So this is your denepazil or your Aricept, your galantamine, your rivastigmine, and these are intended for the mild to moderate stages. But then we also have another drug uh, in the memantine uh, under the memantine name that is an N-methyl-D aspartate receptor antagonist, and this is for the more severe stages. Nowadays, we actually combine those two classes to get the best outcome for people. What you need to know about those is they're the best we've had since drugs have come out over 20 years now for Alzheimer's disease, but they have done absolutely nothing for the underlying disease process that causes Alzheimer's disease. So there is still some debate about the exact cause of Alzheimer's, but most people believe what we call the amyloid cascade hypothesis. So we think that most people actually create amyloid in their brain, but there is a difference in those who develop Alzheimer's and those who don't in the amount of clearing out of the amyloid. So the real issue is the buildup or what we call aggregation of a misshapen protein clump, a sticky little molecule called beta amyloid. So like I said, we all make amyloid, which I think is new news to most people. When you don't have Alzheimer's disease, your immune system is skilled and has the program to chop up the amyloid with enzymes most efficiently in deep sleep, and it doesn't accumulate. This is likely through the coordinated efforts of our lymphatic system and something called microglia cells, which are considered to be the trash collectors in the brain. Unfortunately, when you have the genetic, the environmental predisposition to getting Alzheimer's, you don't have this enzymatic breakdown of amyloid and it accumulates inside brain cells and right outside brain cells and ultimately suffocates them, killing them. For most people, this amyloid buildup happens in a part of the brain called the parahippocampal gyrus, which is in the medial temporal lobes right here, and ultimately spreads throughout the brain, destroying more and more networks and therefore causing more and more of the symptoms. What we do in that medial temporal lobe there is essentially form new memories. And that is why so many people with Alzheimer's have trouble learning new information and seem to have short-term memory problems. So the way this Lakembi works is similar to the other FDA approved drug, which was called Adahelm, is that they are immunotherapy drugs that break down and clear out some of the buildup of the amyloid. They are called anti-monoclonal antibody therapies. It is made through a humanized immuno globulin gamma-1 monoclonal antibody. So that is a whole lot of words to basically say we're trying to mimic a normal immune response. So in a, a normal healthy immune system, we're making antibodies all the time in response to an infection, 
in a disease. So what a monoclonal antibody doing is an antibody that actually is produced in a lab from a cell lineage through a cloning process coming from a unique white blood cell. So all antibodies created downstream from that are basically a replica of that original parent cell. And what these monoclonal antibodies do is they attach to the amyloid, which then signals the immune system to clear it out. So the Lakembi claim to fame is that it breaks down the most toxic amyloid aggregates called protofibrils, okay? And it puts a protein in the brain that helps the immune system target these proteins specifically and says, hey, break these down and remove them. So the overall results of monoclonal antibody studies has actually not been a home run from the beginning. The key seems to be that we needed to have trials that increase the doses to higher than the original um, thoughts of the scientists and researchers, and that we needed to push the intervention into more mildly symptomatic patients. So we've got the mildest stages of Alzheimer's and what they're saying is you actually have to go one step before and hit people when they have mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease. So how do you get the drug? Well, first of all, you have to have the clinical criteria to be in one of those two groups, mild cognitive impairment due to AD or mild AD, plus you have to have biomarker confirmation. So what that means is you either have a spinal tap of CSF, cerebrospinal fluid analysis, or PET neuroimaging that basically shows us that in the brain there is this buildup of amyloid. That has to be coupled with cognitive and functional testing, the kind you would get from a neuropsychologist. So the key here I want you to hear is this unfortunately is not for people who are anywhere past the very mild or the mild stage. There are significant side effects that go along with these medications and it's related to swelling or bleeding in the brain, something called aria, I'm gonna tell you about in a minute. But you also need a baseline MRI before you're eligible to see if you have any increased risks for bleeding on top of having the compound. As you go through the treatments, which are relatively time intensive, it is one hour every two weeks in an infusion. So these are not pills, this is not a shot, this is basically an IV where we're getting an infusion. So two hours per month. You also have to have MRIs of the brain after, um, prior to, pardon me, the fifth, seventh, and 14th infusions because we are so concerned about the, the aria or the bleeding or the edema. The doctor who prescribes it to you must also be a part of something that is called a reporting registry. And the point of all this, it's almost like the fourth tier of a clinical trial, but it's actually available to the public, which makes it very unique, is that we actually still need data to track cognition and function over time to evaluate the benefits and the risks of these infusions. One of the big things that are looking for is the length of time you need them. So do we need them indefinitely? Is this for life? Or do we maybe say after so many weeks, months, or maybe even years, we've reached maximal benefit? The manufacturer is then going to conduct what we call post marketing special use results, or it's kind of basically like a surveillance program to advocate to the FDA for changes in how the medication is delivered. So one thing you need to know, you can't be taking any anti-thrombotic medication, so anything that would give you that increased risk of bleeding. You can be taking any of the other dementia medications that are on the market. So when I talk about appropriate expectations of outcome, you have to remember that within dementia, Specifically, we always think about three types of symptoms. We have the cognitive, we have the mood and behavior, and we have the functional. So what we have data on are two of those. So we know how the can be affects outcome in terms of cognition and in terms of function to a you know, very um, relative degree. Um, we don't have any data whatsoever so far on how it affects mood or behavior. So simply what they have found is that those treated with Lakembi therapy have less cognitive functional decline than in those who were given a placebo. So, Please understand this, it is less decline. It's not get better, 
It's not reverse, it's less decline. But why we're hopeful is that's the best we've ever had. So there was a phase three clinical trial uh, through the marketer SI and Biogen. This was a very large global study called a Clarity AD study in which Lakambi had statistically significant results in global cognitive function. So it is measured by something called the clinical dementia scale and we're looking at um, memory specifically over time. So people who took this drug, this is the big take home message, had 27% less decline at 18 months compared to a placebo, okay? Functionally, we looked at what we call activities of daily living and we saw a benefit of 37% over placebo. So this is ADLs are looking at our ability to function independently. Specifically in this study, they looked at the ability to dress oneself, feed oneself and participate in community activities. Those things are very meaningful when we are loving someone with this disease. Experts say Lakembi and these similar monoclonal antibody drugs bias about a five to six month delay in the progression of symptoms. Okay, so let's talk about those risks. So about two in 10 people are going to have this aria. So this is amyloid related imaging abnormalities. And there's two types, aria E for edema, which is a gathering of excess fluid in the intra and extracellular spaces in the brain, or aria H, which is for hemorrhage. So this can be minor, or pretty significant. What's a little challenging is most people who have it on imaging, meaning on the scans you have the proof, don't have any symptoms. And the symptoms when they have them are relatively nonspecific. So headache, confusion, dizziness. If you look at the general population, many of us would say on any given day, I have one of those symptoms. So it actually gets very challenging. We do wanna to try to figure out who is more at risk for having ARIA and one of the things that is recommended but not required is genetic testing. So APOE4 status is a very helpful piece of information. About 15% of people who have this genetic uh, mutation are homozygous for it, meaning they inherited both sides from both parents they have a higher instance of aria specifically the more symptomatic and the more serious kind compared to people who are heterozygous or people who are non-carriers so before someone takes lakembi they should discuss with their provider do they want to get genetic testing now like we said you can get it without it but it would help you to be more informed and to appreciate your risk be on the lookout for some of those side effects so the big thing that happened after we got full fda approval this summer is that we got approval from what we call cms this is the the government body that dictates the federal policies that tell us will medicare pay for a drug or not there's been a lot of hubbub about the cost of this medication perhaps rightfully so uh, as of today, it is $26,500 that is charged to Medicare. Now, if you don't have a secondary or a supplemental insurance policy, you are expected to pay 20% after you meet your Medicare Part B deductible, and that would be $5,300. What we don't know, and I don't have this information yet, is what if you happen to have a secondary? Many people do. They have United Healthcare, they have AARP. We really don't know at the end of the day, not enough people have gone through this, is, is really what is the out-of-pocket cost. And of course, there's concerns about access that, you know, is this only going to be for people who have the money, for people who have the means to be able to afford it? And that's not really fair. So where I'm very hopeful is, is really more the future than where we're necessarily at today. So monoclonal antibodies, I do think, are the future of treating neurodegeneration, especially Alzheimer's disease. We already, since the summer, have a, another similar but slightly different compound that falls in the same category called denanomab. You'll notice they're all have MAB at the end, um, that worked slightly better in a study of 1,700 people with early Alzheimer's disease and reduced progression from about 35%. So we went from 27%, now we're up to 35%. So this was reported at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference in Amsterdam in July 2023 and published in JAMA. They also suggested that perhaps people don't need these infusions for life. So they were taken off the drug once the plaques in the brain, the amyloid were mostly gone, which took about a year. 
and they followed them over another 18 months and found that the plaques did not reappear and the benefit to memory seemed to continue. We think that the aria happens in about 25 percent of patients um, and like i was saying before not everyone has symptoms only about six percent of people have symptoms the big impact so the big enthusiasm about these drugs is going to come you know a little bit down the road and what we all know to be true who study this stuff is that what we really need to do is capture people much earlier in the disease process so through neuroimaging through genetic studies we are going to be more aware of who is building up amyloid in the decades before they start to show clinical symptoms. These are the people who are then going to be treated with monoclonal antibodies, uh, whether or not it's an infusion or whether or not we're gonna be able to um, do it through pill form, it's not really clear yet. But what we wanna do is essentially keep the amyloid from building up. And this is gonna require knowing who's destined to get it much earlier. So in our 40s and our 50s, probably it'll be tipped off by family history History, then we'll get genetic testing, maybe some early amyloid brain scanning. But once networks have been destroyed by amyloid, remember I said it kind of suffocates it from within and the outside, these are networks of brain cells that are gone. And even though neuroplasticity is very real, it's not realistic to think the brain can build back at that massive an amount of loss. The demand from the public, I believe, is high, is going to be even higher as people see clinics offering this. But in my experience in talking with neurologists, even neuropsychologists, they are not that enthusiastic. Um, most places that could offer it yet have not. We're really starting to gear up. We're starting to build the protocols. It's a whole new world. Like I said, the reason we're enthusiastic is the same reason we have to have a little bit of um, reservation. Most places I know of are a little slow to gather the team together. And partially it's because we don't have um, a good enough published protocol, what has been mandated by the FDA and what has been suggested by the manufacturers is, is frankly kind of weak. We need to make sure we're getting the right people in early enough who are going to benefit the most because there are significant risks. Um, there's a time commitment, there's a financial um, investment potentially for many people and uh, the risks of this edema and the hemorrhage are, are very important to talk about. So here's what I wanna know. Would you, knowing what you now know, you are now an informed consumer of Lakembi, would you take it as it stands now for the perceived benefit, 27% less decline, uh, getting the benefit of five to six months of cognitive and functional ability over not? People are very divided in their answers on this question. So I would love to start a chat in the comments where I would love to know your specific response to this information. Thank you so much for being with me and I'll see you next time. Bye. Mm -hmm.